The Seahawks head coaching search is moving along at a bit of a snail's pace, but there are other things going on that I think are worth mentioning in this latest video. The first thing is, is that it's been announced today that Bobby Slowick is going to have an in-person interview this week with the Commanders and with the Falcons. Now, this is really interesting because there's only two teams named there, which makes you wonder, is, are other teams going to speak to Slowick this week? Is this indicative that the Seahawks are not? going to have an in-person interview with him? I'm not sure. By the time you've watched this video, there may be an update and maybe he is confirmed to come in and have a second interview and, and that's going to be the situation. But as of recording this piece, they have not arranged a second interview with him. I think that will be a little bit disappointing. I have a little bit of a fear which I'm going to touch on in a moment. I just think it'd be worth having him in. And I know that the Texans game against the Ravens has put a lot of people off. I still don't know why it would, because as I said in the video that I did right before that game, that had hammering by the Ravens written all over it. You know, you've got a very established team, the best team in the NFL. Um, Lamar Jackson's the MVP. You have got just organizational structure throughout the Ravens. They may well win the Super Bowl. There's a very good chance unless Patrick Mahomes pulls off some magic, they will be in the Super Bowl. And you've got a Texans team with a rookie head coach, with a rookie offensive coordinator, with a rookie quarterback, with rookie star pass rusher, second year cornerback. You know, it's a very young team and They'd overachieved all year. You know, they won 11 games this season. Who thought the Texans would win 11 games in total when you include the, the playoff win the week before against Cleveland? So they'd, they'd really overachieved to get to that point. And it's on the road, frigid conditions. They're a dome team. There was never any real reason to expect that anything other than what was going to happen happened. So I don't knock Slowick for that in any way, shape or form. Other people have done it, it, at the minute, it looks as if they're not going to have a second interview with him. But like I say, we'll see what happens. There is one comforting factor to this news, though. If the commanders are bringing him in for a conversation, at the very least, and I am going to clutch onto this straw, it suggests that they Ben Johnson to the Washington commanders stuff is not as cut and dried as perhaps some people have suggested. You know, Mike Gar Garofalo has been on this for a few weeks that Adam Peters and Ben Johnson had a connection and that they, you know, were expected to work together and that was going to be the plan in Washington. And nothing has dispelled that since then. You know, he's actually doubled down in a couple of radio appearances on KGR and said that's the expectation. A few other people have said that he's the favourite to go to the Washington commanders. Ian Rappaport has also spoken about his desire to go somewhere and start from scratch. So all of the signs pointing Ben Johnson the way that the Washington commanders. But if they're having Slowick in for an in-person interview, you know, there's no real reason to do that if Johnson is cut and dried. So listen, it might just be due diligence. It might just be about making sure that you speak to everybody you want to speak to, not making it seem like a foregone conclusion, keeping your options open, because who knows if Ben Johnson decides at the last minute that he doesn't want to go there. You've not spoken to somebody else. You know, if your second, if your plan B is Slowick and then he signs for somebody else, I don't know. You've, you've, you have got to go through a process. So I won't read too much into this, but I did take a, a small crumb of comfort that maybe the fact that Slowick's going over there indicates that Ben Johnson to Washington is not absolutely nailed on and that maybe the Seahawks can get him in whenever they can. Obviously next week it would have to be because they're playing. If they lose to the Niners, which I kind of expect, then he'd be free to come and have a conversation whenever next week. And if they win and get to the Super Bowl, he can still come and have a conversation during the bye. But I would imagine that's possibly later in the week. I don't know. I don't know how that works. It might be best to sort of get it out of the way and then get right into the meat of the, uh, the game planning for the Super Bowl after that. So that's for next week. And we'll see whatever happens in that game. The Seahawks will have an opportunity to invite Ben Johnson to Seattle. He has always been the candidate that I've most preferred because I think he easily sort of drops into Seattle and with the weapons they've got can create some something pretty special. As we've seen with Detroit's offense, I think what he's done in Detroit speaks for itself. And, you know, when you listen to him and you hear him speak, I do think he has the leadership qualities that suddenly half of Seahawks Twitter and, and the media think is more important than anything else. So 
We'll see what happens in that situation. I want to talk a little bit about my fear, though, as well. A little bit concerned if Slowick's not coming in, that maybe Johnson won't come in, and that the candidates who are going to get their second interviews this week, Dan Quinn, Ajiro Aviro, Patrick Graham, Mike Kafka, Raheem Morris, are the list. That actually that's the list of candidates that the Seahawks are going to pick from. Now, there's still a chance Mike Vrabel could come in, and they don't have to announce anything on that because he's not employed. But it has been announced that he's going to speak to the Atlanta Falcons on Wednesday. And there's still no nothing about him meeting with the Seahawks. There just was like one report saying the Seahawks were interested in meeting with him, but nothing's been arranged there. My small, minor fear, thinking out loud, I'm doing in this video, is that actually... It has been Dan Quinn all along. You know, when Garofalo was speaking after the, the Dallas game ahead of the Philadelphia game on the radio, he was saying that he, he was hearing during that Dallas game some whispers that Pete might retire and then Dan Quinn would come in. We've had a report uh, from Mike Fisher in Dallas, who's well-connected. Dan Quinn wants the Seahawks job. John Schneider said he's been planning for this for a while because he didn't know when Pete was going to retire potentially. Uh, at some point in the last few years, has there been a, a conversation where, hey, would you be interested to come back if Pete goes? Has this, has this been on the cards for just a long time? And while it gives the impression of a thorough, deep search that they're speaking to numerous candidates, has it just been Quinn all along? Are they just doing a little bit of what the commanders are doing, maybe. Ben Johnson's their guy. We're going to speak to a few others. It's Dan Quinn, Seattle's guy. We're going to speak to a few others. And while we're doing it, hey, you know, Dan Quinn's going to need an offensive coordinator. Maybe when we meet with Mike Kafka, we can create such a positive impression and we can sell him that you've had to work for Brian Dayball and he stripped you of play calling duties on a couple of occasions and he's screaming and shouting at you and it's really toxic in New York. Well, we're never going to take any play calling duties off you. We're going to bring you in. We want you to develop a quarterback because that's what you did with Patrick Mahomes in Kansas City. And by the way, Dan Quinn couldn't be any more different to Brian Dayball and he's you know a great guy and he's not going to create a toxic environment. So we want you to be the offensive coordinator. And maybe do something similar with Ajiro Aviro or Patrick Graham. And have them come in and be Quinn's defensive coordinator. And then they can go out in a press conference and say, whoa, we interviewed some great candidates here. And we actually managed to bring three of them or two of them rather than just one to Seattle. And we think we've got an all-star coaching staff. And Dan Quinn's going to lead the team and be a motivator. And we've got this offensive coordinator in Kafka who's going to develop a quarterback one day. And he's, he's highly rated. And Andy Reid likes him. And, oh, you know, whatever. That would still be just so underwhelming for me. You know, that I, I want to see a clean break from the Carroll era. I want to see a clean break. I want to see new ideas, a new approach. I don't want to see anything that was similar to the past. You know, watching that video that I did a few days ago of one of the reporters in San Francisco asking Carl Shanahan what he made of the Packers Cowboys game. And he went, Well, I watched it and then turned it off for about half time and then smirked. And then, you know, Ben, is it Ben Solak or something? You know, he was from the ringer. He tweeted out that Shanahan and his sort of coaches who've moved on seem to take this kind of like really mean joy out of beating Dan Quinn's defenses. And I'm thinking, why would you want to bring that to the NFC West? You know, is Dan Quinn ever going to get the better of Sean McVay and Kyle Shanahan. I just don't see it. And then, you th you know, I'm, I'm going over all ground here. You guys have all heard me go on about this before. But without Shanahan in Atlanta, his time was really poor. You know, 24-29, he was fired at 0-5. You know, one of the complaints when he was fired was that he had gave players, underperforming players, too much rope. There wasn't enough accountability, that he wouldn't bench anybody. He wasn't playing any, any good. Big Beasley was the example there. That, you know, Raheem Morris took over from him. And the, one of the first things he did was cut Tack McKinley. I think is that his name? Oh, a while ago. 
because he was not getting the job done. So they got rid of him. And that's that was seen as like, oh, Quinn would have never have done that. Is this really what they want in Seattle? And he, yeah, he, he's done okay in Dallas with Micah Parsons. And he did great with the Seahawks, with the LOB. You know, I just, I'm just not sure. I'm not sold on this idea that what the Seahawks actually need is just a great leader like Dan Campbell. Because as I wrote in my article the other day, when Dan Campbell was first in charge, and he still had, by the way, Jared Goff, Amon Ra St. Brown, he had Swift and Williams at running back, he had TJ Hawkinson, the tight end, you know, he had Taylor Decker, Penny Sewell, Frank Ragnow on the offensive line. They had one of the, I think they drafted Jonah Jackson at that point. So they pretty much had all of the offensive weapons that they have now. 29th best offense in the league, 3 13 and 1. Anthony Lynn was his offensive coordinator for the first eight games, nine games. They lost eight of them and tied the other. And then he was kicked off play calling duties. Bring Ben Johnson in, immediate top 10 unit, nine and eight. A year later, top five unit. They've won, what, 14 games now because of the playoff wins? A leader and somebody who's a tough guy who leads and can deliver a great speech, only as good as the tactical men around him. And Dan Kemble's about to lose his main tactical lieutenant this offseason in Ben Johnson. So we'll see what happens next year for the Lions. See if they're any good. See if they get to the NFC Championship game next year. I suspect they're going to really suffer for losing him. Do we really want that in Seattle? relying on Dan Quinn having a great offensive coordinator. And by the way, if you get one, he's going to be out the door straight away. And then you've got to go and find another. That's what went wrong for him in Atlanta. Because as soon as Shanahan went, he brought in Sark, he brought in the, you know, the, the Cotter. Poor. Defense was consistently average in Atlanta when he didn't have the LOB and Parsons. Just can't get excited about that. But... I must admit, increasingly, starting to fear it a little bit. So we'll see. Fingers crossed for some news this week that maybe one or two others uh, are, are going to get the interviews, whether that is a slow it, whether that's a Vrabel, whether it's a Frank Smith, and then next week, hopefully, Ben Johnson. And maybe they can woo Ben Johnson because I still think he is, as Garofalo put it, the bell of the ball in this coaching cycle. I've always thought when the Seahawks move on from Carroll that given the way that Paul Allen approached his coaching searches, Jim Mora aside, that they would go all in to get the top candidate. That's Ben Johnson. So we'll see if they can go and get Ben Johnson. There's one other thing I want to mention today. We've been talking a lot about Mike McDonald and the deadline to arrange an, a virtual interview on Zoom or whatever it is, or Teams, whatever they use, was Sunday. And if you didn't get that done by Sunday, you couldn't arrange an in-person meeting during the Super Bowl bye week. Now, I've been saying, well, the fact that they didn't do that with Mike McDonald suggests that he's not a candidate for them because he, you know, why wouldn't you want to talk to him next week if you can? And I figured that he just wasn't on the radar, that they weren't going in that direction. But, you know, well done to, I, th I think, I think Jeff sent me a tweet from Corbin Smith. I think he was the one who did the digging on this and found it out. And apologies if it was somebody else, but I think it was Corbin Smith's tweet and that he's done the work to discover this. But the NFL has created this stupid rule whereby if you have to sort of, I think if a, if a coach was in the, it was a number one seed, you had to request a virtual interview within three days of the regular season ending and Seattle hadn't fired Pete Carroll by that point, thus didn't have the time to put in a request for Mike McDonald and therefore were locked out of speaking to Mike McDonald and couldn't have put a request in in the last week anyway, even if they wanted to. So now if they want to appoint him, they have to wait till the end of the Super Bowl just to get him in the building, just to have a chat with him on Zoom. I mean, what are we doing here? Like the NFL does so many stupid things. The 17th game, nonsense. The seventh playoff seed, nonsense. Oh, we'll just chuck in a, like a rule whereby everybody gets flagged for even mildly smiling in celebration after a play. Unsportsmanlike conduct. You know, the NFL just does so many dumb things. Like now they've, 
they've basically just opened the floodgates for the Shrine Bowl and the Senior Bowl to let underclassmen come in. Why? Because they're trying to promote the Shrine Bowl. That's the only reason they're doing it. That The NFL just, as, as great as the NFL is, it constantly just makes mind-numbingly stupid decisions. And the Seahawks not being able to have a conversation with Mike McDonald when other teams were because of some dumb rule where you have to, you know, you have to fire your coach within three days of the of the bloody season ending is right up there with, you know, peak stupidity. So Mike McDonald might be a candidate, but if you're going to appoint him, or if you even want to, I mean, they've not even had a chance to chat to the guy. So they'd have to wait till after the Super Bowl just to speak to him. Like he's not an established coach. It's not like you're going and get an Andy Reid. You go, oh, we know Andy Reid and John worked with Andy Reid in Green Bay. We know all about him. We're going to go and get him. Even if it's like Dan Quinn. Oh, we know all about Dan Quinn. So we don't need to meet him before, uh, you know, we, we we bring him in. It's fine. We know him. They're not, they're not going to know Mike McDonald. They're going to need to speak to the guy. So you're really seriously prepared to wait, you know, another week this week. Then the NFC Championship. So you've got another week after that. Then you've got the Super Bowl by. So another week after that. Then you've got the Super Bowl. And then after that, you'll be able to bring him in. I mean, that, that just seems like a long time. By that point, everybody else will have appointed their coaches. You will be behind the eight ball in terms of appointing a staff. Why does that matter? Well, look at the Eagles. They lost both coordinators because they were in the Super Bowl last year. And they were like, they, they wanted Vic Fangio to replace um, the, the Gannon who went to the Cardinals. But by the time that Gannon had agreed that he was going to go to the Cardinals, and that was all, because that was like a last minute thing after the Super Bowl, they kind of met. The, the, the word on the street allegedly was that the Cardinals, well, I mean, I think they, they gave up some compensation before the last draft for this, didn't they? So I don't even think it's an alleged anymore, is that they'd met with Jonathan Gannon before the Super Bowl when they weren't supposed to. And um, the Eagles didn't know about it. So they couldn't put any like contingency plans in place and they missed out on Vic Fangio. That was the, the talks. So they ended up getting Sean Desai as defensive coordinator. He said, so you kind of show a lot of the good options to build the staff around Mike McDonald might be gone by then. So like, let's say Jim Harbaugh gets the charge job this week. He's going to build a staff. And Mike McDonald's work with John Harbaugh might want some of those same staff members, but you can't even get into the bidding war with those guys until you appoint him McDonald. Same with, you know, if Jim Hart, uh, Har John Harbaugh wants to uh, replace certain coaches who might leave with to go with Jim to the Chargers or whatever, or he fears that they're going to be, you know, he's going to be in the same pool. So it's really limited for the contacts that Mike McDonald's going to have. And it, to me, it just makes it a bit of a non-starter. Like he's not an established person that you have a lot of background intel on to say he's going to be our guy so you know i know a lot of seahawks fans a lot of seahawks twitter are really banging the table for my mcdonald like they think he's essentially shanahan um but on defense and listen I'm, i'll just repeat what i said in my video the other day i think he's done a great job at baltimore you can't deny that but i've been as guilty as anybody of kind of like promoting a bit too much hype here because it's like one of the things i was saying is well he took over the 28th ranked defense and then got him eighth and then got him first so what a you know what an incredible job he's done over two years. Yeah, that twenty eight when they ranked twenty eighth, they had a lot of injury issues. It was a down year. The year before, they were the sixth best defense. And Wink Martindale didn't suddenly forget how to coach. He was being lit with head coaching jobs for a long time around that period. They had a down year. They made a change. You know, McDonald came back from Michigan, and then when you actually look at what's happened at Michigan, Jesse Minter went from the Ravens to replace McDonald. He did an even better job this year than McDonald did in Michigan. You know, when McDonald was the uh, coordinator, he did well. But then Minter's done even better, arguably. Look at the way they shut down Washington. So, you know, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm just not sure. And I, I, I said the other day that 20 plus years of Ozzie Newsome and then Eric DaCosta working together, creating what a Raven is, setting out exactly the kind of players that they want to draft. Having John Harbaugh there for as long as they have, and unlike some coaches, Cop Pete Carroll, being a lot more adaptable. I'm not saying that Pete was never adaptable. He changed defense. He changed defensive schemes and stuff like that. I'm not saying he, he's completely, completely un, immovable from his plan. But John Harbaugh, I would suggest, has been a little bit more flexible than, than Pete has and to his benefit. And they've got Lamar Jackson. You know, I... We can all talk about the Ravens' defense if you want. The Ravens are where the Ox have Lamar. Lamar Jackson's the NFL MVP. He's unbelievable. He's having a fantastic season. He protects the ball, dynamic as a runner, passing brilliantly. You know, they run up the score on teams offensively, and then the defense tees off. Lamar ain't coming with Mike McDonald. And 
you know, it is it is a Lamar driven team first and foremost with those Dre weapons. So I don't know. Like people were talking about the Niners game, like, wow, what a job he did against the Niners. He, he out coached Shanahan. Yeah, did he really? If people actually remember what happened in that game, Brock Purdy had well, Brock Purdy's had had some stinkers, and the game against the Packers was a good example of that. In this game, he had like the freakiest turnovers ever, like throws that you never see get turned over, like just a really bad look, really bad turnover look that went all in Baltimore's favor. Lamar was great. The Niners got 429 yards in that game. So they weren't shut down. They had 121 rushing yards in the game. Let's be realistic here about what actually happened in that contest. It was not a Shanahan being smothered in the way that, say, Peyton Manning was in the Super Bowl that Seattle won. So I'm, I'm not quite as sure on whether he's ready, whether he can get the staff, whether he's quite as brilliant as people think. He's like this antidote to Shanahan. To me, it seems a bit like the hype that you get when like Michael Penix plays well against Texas and all of a sudden everybody said he should be the second overall pick. It feels a little bit like that, you know, that reactionary social media hype. It feels a little bit like that with my McDonald. And, um, you know, for me, still the top man is Ben Johnson. I just think he can come in and do with your weapons what he's done with Detroit's. If it sticks with G, if he sticks with Gino, Gino's pretty similar to Jared Goff. I don't see any reason why the Seahawks can't emulate a little bit what the, the Lions did. People going about the offensive line. Detroit's two guards are both free agents in the offseason. Go and get them. And you spend a top 10 pick on a tackle. Abe Lucas hopefully comes back. Go and get the two guards. Invest in a center. Good center draft. Some experienced centers out there who are going to be free agents. Go and get the guy from Dallas. But yes. You know, there's, there's, there's options for you. So you can build that kind of a team that has enabled him to succeed. And Detroit's defense is no great shakes, is it? So, uh, you know, you build a complementary defense to go with it. That is what I would do. That's my preference. Is he going to go to the commanders? Seems that way. Is it setting up for Dan Quinn to take over and it's been that way all along? Maybe so. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comment section. Uh, don't forget to like the video and subscribe. And for more analysis, seahawksdraftblog.com on Tuesday, which is today. I am going to be posting a new horizontal board with the usual 3,000 words of uh, complimentary analysis on the draft. So I would seriously consider checking that out, including, if I do say so myself, a very interesting thought on what John Schneider might do at the quarterback position. So go and check that out on seahawksdraftblog.com. Until next time, though, bye for now.